if you would with me, uh, go ahead and pull out your Bibles, and we will be, uh, again, in, like I said earlier, in the book of Haggai, in chapter 2, this is message 3, and um, I love the way that we'll pray there at the end, because that's exactly what uh, this book is about. It's about living for God's kingdom, it's about having a kingdom perspective, it's about realizing who we are as believers, uh, that we have been redeemed, we've been bought by the blood of Christ, and we stand in a new place, a different place than we used to be before we knew Christ. And so we realize that life is about God, about Christ, and about His kingdom, and about living our lives for that. And uh, that's exactly what this short little book uh, of Haggai is. Again, if you're not familiar with it, if you're with us for the first time, um, the best way to find Haggai is kind of tucked in there. It's, a, it's just a short little book. Uh, you can read it in about 10 minutes. And... Uh, is, is found, if you go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just turn back a few pages, right at the end of the Old Testament, uh, it's the third from the last book of the Old Testament, Haggai. Talking about building God's kingdom, this is week three, and we're going to be in chapter two, verses 10 through 19. Uh, you'll remember that, uh, that we said Haggai is made up of four messages that came from the prophet Haggai, and uh, he is speaking to, uh, to the Jewish people about some things that they definitely needed to hear. Um, as you're getting there, I read this little, little snippet, and today's going to be about obedience and about how we walk in obedience because we are believers. And I read this little snippet, and it was a prayer uh, from a guy who was just being honest, and, I, and to be totally frank with you, I could totally get where this guy was coming from. His prayer went like this, and maybe we can all relate to this. He, he prayed like this. He said, so far today, God, I have done all right. I haven't gossiped yet. I haven't lost my temper yet. I haven't been greedy yet. I haven't been grumpy. I haven't been nasty. I haven't been selfish. I have not been overindulgent yet today. I haven't coveted my neighbor's belongings, and I haven't taken your name in vain, God. I'm doing very well today, and I'm thankful for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. Amen? And, uh, and, and I think we can all relate with that a little bit. We're going we're gonna to find today that Haggai addresses, addresses something that we need to address in our own lives, and that is our obedience. And, and man, wouldn't, wouldn't being a Christian be much easier if we could just stay in bed all day long and never live our lives, never have to face the world that's out there and the problems of the world? But that isn't reality, and it shouldn't be reality. One guy said it's all the stuff that happens after we get up that gives us problems, right? So today's message, just to be totally honest with you, is a candid look and a challenge for us to admit that we deal with struggles in everyday life. In everyday life. It's the struggle of Christians in obeying God. Um, and, and we realize that, uh, that at the foundation of our faith is obedience. Now, don't misunderstand me, and this is, this is at the core of our faith. Obedience doesn't save anybody. If you're a Christian this morning, you didn't get saved because you were good at being obedient. I didn't either. None of us are, are good at that. We, we all fall short of the glory of God. Raise your hand this morning if you're a sinner. You don't have to do that. You don't have to admit it, right? We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We mess up every day. That's why we needed Jesus. We, we, we can't enter into, in, into God's presence and into, into heaven for eternity when we have the blemish of sin on us. And so it took a perfect sacrifice, and that was Jesus. So we, we couldn't ever earn it. We couldn't ever do enough good things to be, to be saved. We're saved by the grace of God. Amen? By sovereign God. Who could do that? Who, who could save us? But once we are saved, because we are saved, we... We're sanctified, we're set apart, and we begin this process of growing in that faith that we now have. And that's where obedience comes in. We, there's just something about, about a believer that's different than when you were a, a non-believer. You begin deep in your heart, and sometimes it doesn't manifest itself because we fall short every day. But, but, but we begin to want to live that life of obedience because we realize what Christ has done for us by, by by dying for us and, and rising on a cross again, rising up from the, from the dead so that we could be saved, if that makes sense. In, in other words, our motives change. We want to be obedient because we are saved. Um, I, I read up a little bit on this passage that we're going to look at this morning from Haggai, and several commentaries, several messages that I read 
Um, as I begin to dig into it myself, I, I, I see that it kind of keeps coming back to this. And I think it kind of enters in, Haggai enters in, knowing that there are some assumptions that we should have about being believers. In other words, because we are Christians, there's some things that are just assumed. The Scripture makes them very clear that we, sh we should be doing or it should be a part of a believer's life. And we'll start there this morning. We'll put these on the screen. I think assumption number one is, is this, like, like this is implied in the Scripture, that because we're saved, Christians want to obey God. Now, do we always obey God? No. But, but deep down, we want to obey God. As Christians, it is genuinely true that, that deep down, not that we always do, but we, we fail every day, but deep down, if we are truly Christians, if you're truly a Christian this morning, because the Holy Spirit of God is in you, deep down, you want to do the right thing. You want to please God. We want to obey. As Christians, we don't... What I'm trying to say is, we, as Christians, we don't wake up each morning saying that our life's purpose is to disobey God. We don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, what I really want to accomplish today is to see how many times I can disobey you, God. Or how many times I can be sinful this morning. We don't, we don't wake up, if, if you're truly a believer, you don't wake up with that, with that premise in mind. The, the second assumption is this. We'll put this on the screen as, as well. And I've already kind of said it. But even though we want to, we realize that no Christian is perfect in obedience. No Christian is perfect in obedience. In other words, there's no super Christian out there who obeys God all the time. There, 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 on Wednesday night, we, uh, we did a study from the book of James, and we were in chapter 3, and that, that particular chapter especially, it's all over the book of James, but in that chapter especially, is a whole section about controlling the tongue, about how, we, um, how our speech is a result of what's in our heart. And James talks a lot about that, but I noticed a verse in James chapter 3, because that wasn't the only sin he was talking about, but in James chapter 3, verse 2, he said this, he said, we all stumble in many ways. Can you relate with that? I mean, we all stumble in many ways. Just because we're Christians, it doesn't mean we have become sinless. See, we've trusted in the sinless one, amen? But, but we haven't become sinless. We, we, uh, for instance, we can become better at not gossiping until we, hurt, until we hear something worth repeating and then, then we struggle with it, right? Um, we can control our temper pretty well until the wrong person ticks us off, right? I mean, so we can, we can work at this and we can grow, but, but we haven't become perfect uh, yet. We do all right until we have to wake up, get out of bed, and get out there in the world, and then, and then it's on like a chicken bone, right? So that leads to, to this understanding as we get into this with Haggai, and we'll put this on the screen. Obedience isn't easy. Obedience isn't easy. It takes effort. You, um, you, you, can't, you can't do it until you begin to practice it. I've told our little basketball team that I, that I coach over and over, like we're never going to do this in a game until we begin to practice it. And it's that way in our, in our lives. We have to practice obedience. It takes effort. And that's something that the Jews of Haggai's day found out rather quickly. Now, just real quick, I want you to remember where we've come from in this. This is a short series, just four weeks, and, and it kind of all goes together. Um, remember what we've covered so far. The Jewish people, if you remember back to two weeks ago when we started this, the Jewish people have been disobedient to God. God let them reap the consequences of that disobedience. Uh, they were, in other words, when, when we sin, there are consequences, right? We don't just get away with it. And so he let them reap those consequences. And for them, um, the consequences of those dis disobedience was that Jerusalem was destroyed. Solomon's temple was destroyed. They were, they were, they were, uh, they were taken captive by the Babylonians who defeated them. They were in exile in Babylon for 50 years. The story goes that after those 50 years, God allows a guy named Zerubbabel to lead a group of them back to Jerusalem after the exile. And so about 50,000 of them return to Judah, back to Jerusalem. When they return, they find that Jerusalem is destroyed. They find that the temple is destroyed. And so immediately, out of obedience, they begin to rebuild the temple. That was the first priority. But then after facing a little bit of opposition, a little bit of 
um, a little, you know, people kind of coming against them, the naysayers, they're facing some persecution. As they quickly become unfocused on building the house of God, which was supposed to be the priority, and instead they take focus off of the temple and they begin to rebuild their homes, they begin to rebuild their businesses, and that was Haggai chapter 1 from two weeks ago. They quit building the temple. So the whole point of that first message, that first sermon, was that they have misplaced priorities. They were doing things, but they weren't God's things. And we struggle with that often. And then if you remember, after 16 years of doing that, 16 years of delay, they finally began to rebuild the temple again. And with great enthusiasm, they launch into this project of rebuilding the temple. Well, that lasted for about a month. After about a month, they become discouraged. And then we see Haggai's second message to them. The, the, the first nine verses of chapter 2, we see that Haggai in, in, in encounters them and encourages them to continue um, even though they are facing uh, this discouragement. And, and last week we talked about what we do when we are discouraged. What we do when things aren't going our way, when things seem to be falling apart, and we say, God, how did I ever get to this place? And we're discouraged. And we said, those are the times we've got to dig deep and we've got to hang on to God because God's never let us go. And, and so we move to where we are today. We're in the middle of chapter 2. Two more months have passed, and the people were downcast again. They feel like quitting. And this time, though, it's not opposition. It's not persecution. It's not discouragement this time. It's gotten them down. This time they're quitting because, get this, the problem is, listen to me real close, the problem is their own disobedience. That, that's the problem. That's why they're quitting. God had told them that they were suffering now because they were being disobedient. And here's the deal. When they started to rebuild the temple, they expected, hey, just because I'm following God, all my problems are going to disappear. Three months passed, nothing's changed. Still, they have their same old problems, and the, the, the temple's still a long way from being finished. And so much like we do many times, when things, listen to me real close, when things seem slow to change, we're, we're in the midst of a problem or a struggle or something's going on, and we think, God, when's this ever going to change? When this is going to get better? Then we start to wonder, and maybe you've been here before, is it even worth it to obey God? Like, this doesn't seem to be working, so do it. is it worth it to obey God? Y'all ever been there? Where we just say, Lord, is this just really worth it? If things aren't going to change, if things aren't going to get easier, then why be obedient? Is it worth it to, to obey God? Why not just, it, hey, I'm saved, so why not just live how I want and do what I want to do and forget about the, the importance of really walking in an intimate, obedient relationship with God? And so that's where they were, and that's where we often are. So Haggai delivers this third message to the people in verses 10 through 19 of chapter 2. And in this message, God speaks directly to people who wondered why things weren't getting better faster. And it's an important, important message for us um, if we've ever wondered if it's worth it to serve God. So let's just begin to walk through the Scripture together. We're just going to kind of take it verse by verse. We're going to start off with a little chunk here. We'll look at the first four verses. And I want you to notice in verses 10 through 13, we'll put this up here. Here's what happens. Verses 10 through 13, Haggai asks two questions. Okay, and you're going to notice these questions here in these, in these first four verses. Uh, first three or four verses. You're going to notice, beginning in verse 10, he says, On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. So this is the third time he's speaking to these people who have come back uh, to Jerusalem. And verse 11 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat, so here's the first question. Remember, there's two questions. He said, If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the priest answered, and they said, No. Now we're going to come back to this and explain it. Verse 13 says, then Haggai said, here's the second question, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered, and they said, it does become unclean. Now, I'm going to admit right here, that sounds a little bit weird to us. We're like, you know, that's what, we're, that's what we're looking at at church on Sunday morning. Like, what does that teach us this morning? But I'm going to tell you, it would have made total sense 
to the people of that day that Haggai was speaking to. The Jews had hundreds upon hundreds of laws that governed every aspect of their life. And most of those laws had to do with understanding what was holy and what was not holy. Holy things were objects that had been set apart for God's use. Um, usually those things were used in temple worship. Because God is holy, only holy objects could come into His presence. And, the, and His presence was in the temple. An unholy object is not necessarily, get this, it's not necessarily sinful in and of itself. But if it was used then for a common purpose, then it would be considered unholy then for temple use. Now, you're like, okay, what does that mean? I found a good example. For instance, think about this. Um, a pot might be holy because it had been dedicated to the Lord's use. It was, it was used in the temple. But if you took that same pot out of the temple and used it to cook a meal at home, then in that case it was then rendered ordinary or, or common. In other words, it wasn't set aside just for temple use anymore. So Haggai knows this culture, and he basically asks them two questions here in the Scripture. And here they are. And I'm not reinventing the wheel here. He asks, what if something that's holy touches something that's unholy? Does the unholy thing become holy? And he says, no. And then he says, what if, a holy thing t what if a, an unholy thing touches a holy thing? What happens then? And he says, it becomes defiled. So we can summarize it this way. I'm going to put it on the screen, try to make it make sense. In other words, holy touches unholy, okay? Holy touches unholy. The, holy, the unholy object remains unholy, okay? So that's the first thing he's saying. Now here's the second one. Unholy touches holy. We'll go there. Then the holy object becomes defiled. And you're like, okay, cool. How does that help me today, sitting here at Cross Haven Church? On a Sunday morning in 2021, listen to me. And you may be, we may be 10 minutes in here, and you're like, "What? What is Murph talking about?" In a way that they would have understood, Haggai is giving them a lesson about the power of sin, and that's what I want us to walk away with from here today. I found a great illustration of this, so I'm going to I'm going to use it. And here's basically what he was trying to say. Suppose you wash your hand, and then you touch a dirty plate. Okay, what happens? Does your clean hand make the dirty plate clean? The answer is no. But the dirt on the plate rubs off on your hand. Now, change the image. Let's look at the other one. Suppose, that, suppose your child walks on your clean carpet with dirty shoes. What happens? The dirt on the shoes quickly stains the carpet. Sin is like dirt. It spreads quickly. Just as it's hard to keep a house clean, right? It's hard to keep a life clean because sin stains everything. Here's another illustration I've borrowed. Sin, sin is contagious. Suppose a person with a cold kisses a person who is in perfect health. Will the sick person catch health from the healthy person? The answer is no. But the healthy person could easily catch a cold from the sick person, right? Sin is, sin is like dirt. It's like a disease. It transfers much easier than holiness does. Or we could, we could say it another way. Sin is like spaghetti sauce. It stains everything it touches, right? Or the example I thought of as I was trying to understand this, I thought that immediately my mind went back to when I was a kid. I can remember playing soccer when I was a kid, and we were playing in the state soccer tournament in Huntsville, and it rained, it poured down rain, and we played, if any of you have ever know anything about Huntsville, y'all talk to me. What color is the dirt in Huntsville? It's red, right? And I remember that it, it poured down rain and we played that state soccer tournament and we basically, like we, we, like, we put our socks in the dumpster before we came home. They were so stained, they were so red, we had to throw them away. And it just reminds me that, that sin is like that. It stains. It messes us up. When we get to verse 14, and I want you to see what verse 14 is about. Look at this. What, what Haggai is saying is that when your heart isn't right with God, then the things that you do will be wrong. It's still, just like I was talking about with the tongue, like what you say is a result of what's in your heart, that's where sin comes from. When, when your heart isn't right with God, then the things you do will be wrong. Notice what he says in verse 14. It says, Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people, 
and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there, notice what he said, what they offer there is unclean. He was dealing with the people whose hearts weren't right. They were sinning, and they were justifying it. Let's be real honest today. You ever been there? You're walking in sin, and you're justifying it, but you know deep down it's not honoring God. As a result, what they offered in the temple was unclean. That's why he said what they offered there is unclean. Now, I know that sounds simple, but it's so true. As Christians, we can continue in sin. We can justify our sin. We can make excuses for our sin. And it's still, at the end of the day, sinful, right? It, it will still be wrong. And we're still taking advantage of the very grace that God has shown us by saving us. It, it said that what they offered there was unclean. The more accurate word there from the original Hebrew was actually whatever they offered there was unclean. Whatever they offered, as long as they were being disobedient, they could do anything there and it was still considered disobedience because they were mocking God with their sin. They were living indifferently to His Word. And, and in other words, church to them had just become a game. Whatever they did, it was just a show. Whatever they offered there was unclean. Some versions say whatever they offered there was defiled. And here's the application for us. When your heart isn't right with God, when my heart isn't right with God, whatever we do will be wrong. You see, God, God wanted more from them than just for them to build a physical temple. He wanted the hearts of the people. He wanted their hearts to be fully devoted to Him. God didn't want a nice temple filled with empty hearts. And I can tell you today, God doesn't want a nice church building filled with empty hearts. And it's still the same. You, you, you can't come to church. I can't come to church. None of us can come to church and think that we're doing God some kind of favor by attending and being a part of it when we are indifferent to sin. If we're just living it up, living life however we want to, indifferent to God, if the whole Christian thing is just a game we play and then we come to church, we have to realize that God's saying that it doesn't honor Him and that what we offer is unclean. One writer said, and he said this, he said, write this down big and plain. You can't fool God. He isn't impressed by religious ritual unless it is accompanied by a humble heart. You see, it all begins in our hearts. We've got to want to walk in the ways of God. We've got to want to hate sin. God wants our hearts because that's where it begins. I, I couldn't help. It just kept coming back to me this week. I kept thinking of Proverbs 4.23 about how it starts in the heart. In Proverbs 4.23, look at this scripture. It says, above all else. In other words, the biggest priority, above anything else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So, the, the, I think the big question this morning, I'm, I've asked myself, I'm asking you, what about our hearts? What's most important to us? Let's get a little deeper. Only you know, you and God know, just think about yourself. What sins are you walking in right now and you're just justifying them? You're saying to yourself, well, this is just who I am. This is just the way I become. Or maybe God will overlook this and it'll be okay. I know this doesn't honor Him. I know this is not kingdom building. I'm just, I'm just living in this. What sins are you justifying? What do you need to come clean with God about? How about your heart? What's most important to you? And maybe this is a little bit about what Jesus meant when He said that we have to come to Him like little children to enter into the kingdom of God where we are honest and, and, and we are true with God. Look at verses 15 through 17. You're going to notice that it's important to learn from the past. This is the next thing that He shows us. Now last week we, we saw that, that He told them not to dwell on the past. In other words, don't let the past, don't spend your time comparing. They were struggling with the fact that the temple had not been rebuilt to its old glory. And it wasn't like Solomon's old temple. And they were, some of the ones that were old enough to remember the temple were saying, you know, what's the use? It's, it's nothing compared to what it used to be. And God was telling them, don't, don't spend your time dwelling on the past, but I'm about to build a newer and bigger thing. So that's what we said last week. But this is a little bit different. It is important to learn from the past. We can't live in the past and dwell in the past, but it's important to learn from the past. 
Notice in verses 15 through 17, it says, Now then consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you in all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. It's giving them a flashback of what had happened. Now, um, we can't waste our lives, like I said, comparing things to how they used to be, all the while missing the time that God's given us right now. But, but this is a little bit different. In these verses, God reminds them of how things were before they began to rebuild the temple. Before they began to rebuild the temple, which is what they were supposed to do, remember two weeks ago, that was the priority, and they misplaced their priority, they were living in disobedience. And the result of that, he tells them in these verses, is that when they lived in disobedience, I'm telling you there are consequences to disobedience. He said, when you were living in disobedience, you went broke, economically and spiritually. This is what Haggai is talking about in verses 15 through 17. And here's what was happening. Every time they made money, half of it disappeared. They were losing 60% of their investments. They were tanking. The entire nation was in decline. All because they had disobeyed God. But notice the last phrase. It says, you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. That's all God wanted all along. He wanted His people to turn to Him with a whole heart, put Him at the center of life. They had pushed Him to the edge of their priorities. They were living life, but they weren't living it for Him. And as a result, they were reaping the consequences. I just want to remind us this morning that God won't take that for long. God is a jealous God, and God is, has every right to be jealous. That leads maybe to the most important thing I think we'll learn today. And there's a principle that we often misunderstand, and here it is. As Christians, as believers, I want you to see this. God disciplines Christians to restore us. Notice this. God disciplines Christians to restore us. The main objective of God in disciplining Christians is not to punish us. We've been saved by the grace of God. Eternal punishment comes to those who don't know Christ and never trust in Christ. But for Christians, God's discipline is the, the, the most important objective of that is not to punish us, it's to restore us and change us and grow us. Jesus took the, the punishment for sin already. He died for it. So when we as Christians sin, we have to realize we're mocking, we're mocking what Jesus did for us. When we live in sin, it isn't like God makes himself more holy by punishing us harder. He punishes Christians in order to restore us and grow us. And the scripture today shows us that for the Jews, God was behind their hard times. God allowed those hard times. God caused those hard times. And He was doing it to restore them and help them grow. He wanted their hearts to turn back to Him. Listen, we can have some bad moments in our lives, can't we? Let's just be honest. We can have some really bad moments as Christians. But thank God this morning for His grace. Thank God for His grace. Thank God that His objective is not to get us or to hurt us, but He wants us to hate sin and grow through those failures and repent and do life His way and, and draw to a deeper, more real, and more right relationship with Himself. Now we get to verses 18 and 19, the last couple of verses. And He wants, uh, this is the best way I knew to phrase it. Here's what it is. He wants them to understand the, import, the importance of now. He's talking about the past that he wants them to understand the importance of now and what it has to do with later. He wants them to understand the importance of now and later. And here's what I mean by that. Look at the Scripture. I think it will explain itself. Verses 18 and 19 says this. It says, Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month. We're living in today, he says, but I want you to consider this day and I want you to consider onward. Since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on, listen to me real close. How often have we said that? How often have we made promises to God from this day on, God? From now on, God, listen to me. We're dealing with our sin. From now on, God, I won't ever do that again. Y'all ever been there? Lord, I, Lord I'm so, I feel 
horrible about the choices I've made or the things I've done or where I'm at right now. God, please forgive me. God, I'm not ever going to do that again. And then we do it again, right? We, we have to realize the past is the past. We can't change that, but we should learn from it. We should get to changing those sinful choices into obedient choices. And there's two things about that we have to realize. One, look at this. Blessings begin when we obey. Blessings be, begin when we obey. Here's the deal. We were made to worship God, not to live in sinful choices. But, but, but I mean, from the time of Adam and Eve, we've dealt with the, the sin nature of ourselves. I mean, we, but we were made to be worshipers of God. I know this is a terrible example, but we, that's, that's what we were made to be. Okay? And I, and I keep thinking about it. Y'all remember that story I told last week about the rabbits in the parking lot? Y'all remember that? A few of y'all remember that? I just kept thinking about it. Way I can't get it off my mind. And to those of you that didn't hear the story, I mean, just real quick, I was, I was here in the church last week, and, and I looked out the front doors, and there was a car out in the parking lot, and it looked like somebody that needed help. And this other car drives up real fast, and before I could ever get out there, two people dressed like rabbits jump out of the car. <laughs> and they had a gas can, and the lady had run out of gas, and they put gas in the car. And, before, and as I'm getting out there, I'm, I'm going out there to see them, they drive off. And it was two people, they were dressed like rabbits. I thought, that's not right. That, that is just not right. I mean, they were full rabbit costumes with the ears and the feet and all that. I'm like, this is the world, the world ain't right. I mean, who, I mean, people driving around like rabbits. And then I found out this week, I've, it's just bothered me. Like, I've been totally unfocused on anything I'm supposed to do. I can't stop thinking about it. And, like, some people do that on purpose. Like they go, like, like I didn't understand, and I, I don't know, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Like some people like dress up like animals every day. Look, you, we're, we're human beings. We're supposed to be people, right? Well, God made us. Listen, listen. God made us to be worshipers. We're, we're we're made to worship God. I mean, that's what we were created to do. But our sins taken us away from that. Just like a human ain't supposed to be a rabbit, we're, it's not right. We're not supposed to live in sin. We do it because we have a sin nature and we've turned against God. It's not what we were created to be. We're created to be worshipers of God. And through the blood of Christ, we were restored back to a place where we were supposed to be to start with. Okay? And so we have to realize that, that when we begin to walk in that way again, when, we, when, when it, we're as, as Christians and then we begin to, to make those choices daily, to walk in obedience to God, that that's when blessings begin to happen. I, I don't mean that, that I'm going to obey God today so God's going to make me a millionaire. That's not what I'm saying. But blessings begin, true blessings begin to happen when we obey. And, and see, for them, after delaying for 16 years, the, the Jews had finally started to rebuild the temple. They had a long way to go. To, to go. Their fields were still barren. I think of them, I think some of them are wondering if all this talk about rebuilding the temple was worth the effort. And many of us, like I said, we look at our problems the same way. We feel like we're so far away from what we, what we should be. And it's easier to say, Lord, what's the use? Why bother in trying? Things will never be different. Let me, let me share a little illustration, I think. And I saw this a long time ago. And I think it's, you know, some of y'all may have heard this. And, and I think it's helped many people. It's helped me. But just in a general sense, I've heard this before. Listen to it. If you, and here's what it says. It says, if you find your life in a bit of a mess, just remember that you didn't get where you are overnight. You ever kind of heard that principle? You got there by taking a thousand steps in the wrong direction over a period of time. Therefore, don't be surprised if it takes you quite a few steps to get your life back in order again. You normally don't change your thinking overnight, and you don't break bad habits in one week. Think of it this way. Every day you make thousands of decisions, most of them very small, but each decision either leads you toward the light or back toward the darkness. If your life is messed up, you feel like everything around you is total darkness and you wonder if you'll ever see the light again. The answer is it depends on you. When you wake up, ask the Lord to help you walk toward the light. Not just in the light, but toward the light. If you keep taking tiny steps toward the light of God, little by little, the shadows will begin to lift, and one day you'll wake up to the blazing light of God's presence all around you. Listen, and it's just the point of B that, you know, a thousand small decisions get us where we are. But it, it takes walking in obedience to ever begin to see those blessings of God manifest themselves. 
I kept thinking over and over about, about what 1 John 1, 7 says. I've, I've memorized this verse a long time ago. This description says, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. It, it's just this reminder that walking in obedience is going to be the right thing. It's the only place where true blessing ever comes. Um, and it's just this reminder, we'll put this on the screen, that the harvest will come in due time. I'm just trying to tell you it's worth it to be obedient to God as a believer. That, that truly is the right way. And, and farmers get this principle right here, the, the, the harvest will come in due time. I mean, I, I'm not very good at it. Last year we planted you know, some stuff, and I'm like, I planted it, and like the next week I'm like, where is it? You know, Why is it not growing like it should? All I'm seeing are weeds or whatever. Listen, you don't plant today and harvest tomorrow. It takes a few weeks to plant and, and, and poke its way through the soil and more weeks and months for, for, for the fruit or the vegetables to, to ripen for harvest. And for, historically, it took the, it, if you look at history, it took the Jews four years to finish rebuilding the temple. And they faced opposition and discouragement all along the way. It hadn't... Uh, it, 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 you know, they, they, were, they were wanting this, this quick turnaround and God was saying, be obedient, be obedient, walk in obedience, make the right choices, don't worry about it, make the right choices and the blessing will come. You're going to reap an abundant harvest eventually. Be faithful, I promise the harvest will come in. And that's an important precept for us as Christians to remember. Sometimes we grow weary. Here's the honest truth. We don't have to play the church game. Sometimes we grow weary in serving the Lord. Sometimes we grow weary in doing that. And we wonder, is the effort in vain? Is, is this really worth it? And it's because we take our eyes off eternity and we're looking at the here and now. God says, plant the seed. Let me take care of the harvest. Paul declared, he told the church at Galatia this. He told the Galatians, these, these new Christians in Galatians 6, 9. Look, look at this. He, here's what he told them. And this stands true for us today. He said, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So what's the secret to obedience? It's, it's don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing what's right. Because right's always going to be right and wrong's always going to be wrong. Just in closing this morning, let me, let me kind of give you some summary thoughts. Here, here's a summary. Here's the first thing I would say, just wrap, just putting all this together. Holiness, here's what, he's, here's what he's told us. Here's what Haggai's told us. Holiness is not contagious, but corruption is. Holiness is not contagious, but corruption is. You, you don't, listen, you're not going to catch holiness by just hanging around some holy people. You've you got to get right with God for that to, to happen. You've got to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ and begin to walk with Him in an intimate way. You don't, you don't catch holiness just by going to church or hanging out with some, with some good Christian people. If you're, if you're a Christian, if you already know Christ, then remember the opposite. We're, not, we're in this world, but we're not supposed to blend with this world. We're not supposed to continue in a lifestyle of sin and indifferent to it. The, the, the book of Jude would be a great one to read this, this week. The book of Jude actually says... That, that our purpose, really as believers, we're here to snatch sinners out of the fire. That, that's, what we're, that's supposed to be our focus. We can't be indifferent to sin. We've got to hate sin. We've got to want to grow. We've got to remember every day that Jesus died for us and He saved us by His grace. So holiness is not contagious, but corruption is. The second thing I would say is God will not bless a cause, no matter how great that cause may be. And for them, it was the temple. It was building the temple. Whatever our cause may be, God will not bless a cause, no matter how great, unless the people involved in it are holy. The temple was the greatest cause on the planet Earth in that day. Um, God would manifest His presence and His glory to His people there. Sacrifices for sins were offered there. The various feasts and celebrations took place there. These people were offering sacrifices. They were going through the rituals but their hearts were not right before God. They were being fake. They were being hypocritical. To, to live for us, to live in unrepentant sin and do that continually and then come to the house of God for worship, 
it, and, and act like act like it's not so and act all Christiany. It's just not right for them to come to the temple that way. It was like he used that example. It was like dragging a dead corpse into the temple. It defiled everything. If they thought God would would bless them just because they were involved in rebuilding the temple, they thought wrong. They were sadly mistaken. God isn't fooled by that. And if we think that God's pleased just by us coming to church and, and gracing everyone with our presence, then, then we're wrong. It, it matters how we live. Listen, I want to say this. In our day, the church, Christ's church, His bride, is the greatest cause in the world. Jesus said, I will build my church in Matthew chapter 16. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 5 that Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. The church, when I say the church, I mean the people. I mean ecclesia, the people, not the building, is God's temple. And where he dwells, he makes himself known on this earth today. Haggai's word to us is you can be involved to the hilt in the local church. You can, you can give money to the church. You can be on staff at the church. You can, you can be a deacon or an elder in the church. You can teach a life group in the church. You can be on a ministry team in the church. You can lead. You can do all kinds of things. But if your heart is not clean, then you're missing the point. The third thing is this, and the last thing. Holiness that pleases God must be inward, not just outward. Remember, I'm just re. re Restating this, it starts in the heart. We often, and we struggle with it, we often look at outward activity because it's what we can see. Lord, Lord, look at what they do for you, or look at what I do for you. But we have to remember, the Scripture tells us over and over that God looks on the heart. God knows the heart. Do we do what we do from hearts that have been made clean through faith in Christ? Do we turn toward God and walk in obedience because we love Him and we're thankful for what He's done for us? Are we living in integrity rather than hypocrisy? It's not enough to build His temple. We must build from hearts that please Him and knowing that He knows every thought, knows everything. Do we truly seek Him out every day? Do we, do we take every thought captive to obedience like Paul said in 2 Corinthians? Do we pluck out our eye to cut off or cut off our hand if need be in order to be holy before God like it says in Matthew chapter 5? If not, it's like it says in Matthew 6, we're only practicing righteousness before men. In other words, we're just doing what we do for show rather than it coming from the heart. The inward causes what happens in the outward. In other words, you can, you can, you can have an outward appearance of holiness and your heart be way off from God, but eventually it finds you out. I read a quote this week, and I've been thinking about it all week. It's just, it just a reminder of what we need to be. It says, a holy man is an awesome weapon in the hands of God. I'll close with this, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. And this is maybe where we need to go. This is what we need to do if we're talking about our obedience and we've got some things we need to get right with God. Here's what the psalmist said. This is what David said. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Listen, revival for the church, God using His people to make a difference in the lives of the lost, it can't happen when we're walking in disobedience. It is time. It is time for us to repent, to let go of the sins we're hanging on to, things that are distracting us when we're supposed to be building the temple. Maybe it's time to kind of get honest with God and get honest with ourselves. Listen, in way of invitation this morning, as we close, I just want to say two things. One, for believers, for Christians, those that already know Christ, um, and I'm speaking to myself too, what do we need to do before the Lord? What sins are we hanging on to? What do we need to just get honest with God about? Maybe this week, maybe maybe you just need to find a quiet place and just, <laughs> maybe before you leave today, maybe when you get home, whatever it may be, just get before God and be honest with Him and say, God, i got some things 
that have got to be straightened out. And I got to, I've got to, I've got to turn over to you, and I've got to honor you with. The second part of the invitation is this: if you're not a Christian and you're like, this all sounds well and good, but I don't even know if I've been forgiven. I don't know if I know Christ. Then listen. That's the message we proclaim as the church. We want you to know that there is one way and one way only to have a relationship with God, and that's through Jesus Christ. You have to admit that you're a sinner. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And you have to be forgiven of that sin, and the only way to be forgiven of that sin is through Christ. The Bible says that no man comes unto the Father unless he comes through Jesus Christ. And if you don't know the, if you don't know the Lord, then we want you to know that you can do that through Christ. That's the only way you can do that. If you need someone to step you through that and help help you understand what it means to ask the Lord to forgive you and to ask Jesus to save you, then we're here and we're available to do that. You can always talk to me or Josh is here, Sharon's right, any, or you may have somebody that invited you to church, and that may be the person you need to talk to, but we want to make that available to you. We want to share with you what the gospel is and, and, uh, and for you to understand that. So that is, uh, is our message and way of invitation. I've asked Josh uh, Swindle, our youth pastor, to come and pray for us uh, before we go and then just share a couple of announcements before we dismiss in the way of some things that are going on ministry-wise with the church. Thank you all. Let's pray this morning uh, before we close as we dismiss. God, once again, we thank you for the day that you've given us. God, I thank you uh, for your truth and your word. God, I thank you, um, God, that you have provided a way. God, that you, you've given us uh, hope. And it's an opportunity for salvation in Christ and in Christ alone. And God, I pray that we would pursue uh, holiness. God, your standard of righteousness. Um, God, your way and not our way. So God, teach us uh, to be like Christ um, in every way possible. God, help, help change our attitudes, our actions, our behaviors. Uh, to not only be like Christ, but to model, um, to model Christ in our lives. So that people, when they see us, they see Jesus, and, and, and that the world may, may know uh, who he is through, through our lives and the conversations that we have. And God, use us uh, to help build your kingdom here. God, we love you. We pray that you go with us uh, as we leave and bring us back safely, uh, if it be your will. So in Christ's name we pray. Amen.